Hear ye, hear ye. The following scene is a reenactment of Perry versus Schwarzenegger, the Prop 8 trial heard in the U.S. District Court. Dr. Nancy Cott, Professor of American History at Harvard University, expert witnesses for the plaintiffs on the history of marriage, is under direct examination by the plaintiff's lawyer, Theodore Boutrous. The plaintiffs in this case are two loving same-sex couples who simply want to marry, just as any heterosexual couple in America has the right to do. The court is now in session. Yeah, well, first of all, marriage, the ability to marry, to say, I do, it is a basic civil right. It expresses the right of a person to have the liberty to be able to consent validly. And this can be seen very strikingly in American history through the fact that slaves during the period, the long period that American states had slavery, slaves could not marry legally. Why were slaves barred from marrying? Uh, because as unfree persons, they could not consent. They did. They lacked that very basic liberty of person. Control over their own actions oh, 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 oh. enabled them to say, I do, with the force that I do has to have, which is to say, I am accepting the state's terms for what a valid marriage is. A slave couldn't do that because the master had rights over the slaves. Ability to escort his person or to make any claim. A slave could not obligate himself in the way that a marriage partner does obligate himself or herself. And what happened when slaves were emancipated? When slaves were emancipated, they flocked to get married, and this was not trivial to them by any means. They saw the ability to marry legally to replace the informal unions in which they had formed families and had children, many of them, to replace those informal unions with legal, valid marriage in which the states to which they lived would presumably protect their vows to each other. In fact, one quote that historians have drawn out from the record, because many of these ex-slaves were illiterate, illiterate, of course, but one quotation that is the title of an article a historian wrote, it was said by an ex-slave who had also been a Union soldier, and he declared, the marriage covenant is the foundation of all our rights, meaning that it was the most everyday exhibit of the fact that he was a free person. He could say, I do, to his partner. And then, in corollary with that, because, of course, the history of slavery is happily behind us, there are other ways to which this position of civil rights and basic citizenship is a feature of the ability to marry and to choose the partner you want to choose. What would happen to be an example of another one of those features? Well, I want to use an example of that. That, again, doesn't have to do with the slave. It has to do with a black man, Dred Scott, who tried to say, when he was in a non-slave-holding state, that he was a citizen. And in an infamous decision, the Supreme Court denied him that claim. And why this is so relevant here is that Justice Kaney spent about three paragraphs of the opinion remarking that the fact that Dred Scott, as a black man, could not marry a white woman. In other words, that there were marriage laws in the state where he was, and many other states that prevented blacks from marrying whites, was a stigma that marked him as a less than a full citizen. Because if he had had free choice, Kaney wouldn't have mentioned it. But he remarked on it because of the extent it, to which this limitation on Dred's ability to marry was a piece of evidence that Justice Kaney was remarking upon in his opinion to say this shows he could not be a full citizen. Now, going back to the era of slavery, would slaves form something that they would call marriage or that the slave owners would call marriage, at least informally? Yes. And was that viewed by the state or by society as an important relationship? Certainly. It was regarded as an important relationship within slave communities. They were the only relationships they had, these informal relationships. But they were totally treated with abandon by white society, broken up all the time. And no, no state authorities gave any protection or credence to these relationships whatsoever. And as a historical matter, to what do you attribute the desire to be formally married by the state upon emancipation? Well, it was, as I suggested, because this was a common sense indication of freedom, of possessing basic civil rights. And because they assumed it would mean to them that white employers, because of course the ex-slaves were still quite poor and employed by whites, whites were, well, at any rate, white employers would often try to demand that families worked a certain way, or that children worked, and so on. And 
And so the emancipated, the free men and women, assumed that once they were legally married, that they would make valid claims about their family rights.